Welcome to lecture number seven. Last time I proved these results. So first of all, we talked about unreduced suspension spectra of orthogonal spaces. And I determined the k-equivariant zero-dimensional homotopy group in terms of unstable equivariant homotopy information of the orthogonal space Y. So here's the result again. This group, the zeroth k-equivariant homotopy group, is a free abelian group. And we can name a basis. We get a basis by looking at the following classes. We look at classes Y in the zeroth L-equivariant homotopy set of the orthogonal space Y. Then you apply the stabilization map, sigma L, which gets you to the stable equivariant homotopy groups. And then you transfer up from L to K. And to actually get a basis without redundancy, these choices should run over conjugacy classes of subgroups L of K, which are closed, such that the vial group of L and K is finite. And moreover, the little y should run over representatives of the orbits of the vial group acting on this unstable equivariant homotopy set. The case that we are mostly interested in is when the orthogonal space is the global classifying space of a compact Lie group. And at the very end, I have specialized the result to this case. And then the following came out. The zeroth k equivariant homotopy group of the suspension spectrum of the global classifying space of G is again a free abelian group. And this time, a basis is given by the following classes. You take the stable topological class associated to the group G. You restrict along a continuous homomorphism alpha that is defined on a closed subgroup L of K, and then you transfer up from L to K. And here the pairs L and alpha run over representatives of the K times G conjugacy classes. And moreover, the L has to be a closed subgroup with finite vial group, well and alpha is any continuous homomorphism. And I remind you that K times G acts by simultaneously acting on the L taking it to the conjugate subgroup and also conjugating the homomorphism in the front and in the back with the elements from K and G. Now let me draw a corollary, and this corollary determines the abelian morphisms groups in the global Burnside category. The group A of G, K which was defined as the group of natural transformations of functors from orthogonal spectra to sets, from the zeroth G equivariant homotopy group functor to the zeroth K equivariant homotopy functor, is free abelian with a basis given by the following classes. Well, in this case, the classes are operations, natural transformations. And they are transferred from L to K after restriction along alpha. And this is for the same kind of choices as up here for L alpha in a set of representatives of the K times G conjugacy classes. pairs, L alpha, and then the same conditions as upstairs, with L a closed subgroup of K with finite vial group, and alpha continuous homomorphism defined on this subgroup. So let me give you the proof, which basically is putting two results we've previously, previously proved together. So we look at evaluation at the fundamental class, um, E sub G. So this is a map from A G K to the case equivariant homotopy group of sigma infinity plus global G. So this is an isomorphism.
This is something that I proved in lecture 5. And moreover, this takes the candidate basis So the classes here that we would like to show our basis to a basis. Because by design, these classes go to those classes here, where we know from the last lecture that there are bases. So we done an isomorphism of abelian groups. If it takes a family of classes to a basis, then they have been a basis here in the first place. Now we have not only calculated the individual abelian morphism groups in the global Burnside category, but if we're putting everything together, we have in fact completely calculated the global Burnside category as such. So let me briefly explain this. Um, instead of, it, on top of the morphism groups, we would also need to understand composition in this category. A general element in here is a finite z-linear combination of these classes. This is a pre-additive category, so composition is additive in both variables, it's bi-additive. So that means if we compose a sum with another sum, we can expand this by bi-additivity. That reduces the question about how composition works to composing two operations of this kind, a restriction and a transfer, and then another restriction and a transfer. And we can bring those into the kind of canonical form by moving the other restriction past the transfer and then collecting restrictions together and transfers together. When we move another restriction past the transfer, we have to break this up into two cases. The other restriction is first a restriction to a subgroup and then an inflation. And when we restrict to the subgroup, then we get a big sum in general but because we have to use the double coset formula. And afterwards, we have to do the inflation past the transfer and that is was the simpler formula. So if you think about this, then you see that these classes uh, are not quite a monomial basis of this category because the fact that we sometimes have to use the double coset formula where one composite expands into a sum means that you don't really have elements which are a basis for all compositions but nevertheless we have enough relations to completely understand how the generators compose and hence how finite linear combinations of these generators compose. So in this sense we completely understand the global Burnside category, and this will be very useful soon because now we want to look at additive functors out of the global Burnside category. So this is another important concept, and I want to give it a name, and I want to write it down as a definition. So I want to define what a global functor is. Global functor is simply an additive functor from the global Burnside category to the category of the leading groups. So it's a functor in the first place, and moreover, for each homomorphism abelian group, the map given by the functor should be a homomorphism of abelian groups. So this is a very important concept for us, because these global functors play the same role for global stable homotopy theory that abelian groups play for non-equivariant stable homotopy theory, and that G-Mackey functors play for G-equivariant stable homotopy theory for a finite group at a time. I will have to make a lot of comments about this because it's important and there are various things I should say, but before I do that, I have to erase the whiteboard. The category for which I write GF of global functions and additive natural transformations Pointwise notion of exactness, with exactness detected pointwise. So this is a completely general fact that has nothing to do with the global Burnside category, 
So whenever you have a pre-additive small category and you look at the category of additive functors and additive natural transformations, this will be an abelian category. As you surely know, abelian category is a, uh, abelian is a property of a category and it's not extra structure. And if this property is satisfied, then there's a notion of epimorphism, monomorphism, kernel, co-kernel, and exact sequences. And whenever you're in the situation of such a functor category, then it turns out that a morphism is an epimorphism, monomorphism, if and only if it is pointwise, meaning evaluated at every object, in our case at every compact Lie group, the associated morphism of abelian groups is an epimorphism or monomorphism. Similarly, with kernel and co-kernel, they are given pointwise by evaluating at all compact Lie groups. And also, a sequence is exact if and only if, when you evaluate it at every compact Lie group, it is exact. So it's an abelian category that is very similar just to modules over ring. Uh, and we understand this quite well. Um, Another property of these particular kinds of abelian categories is that they have enough projectives and injectives. So more precisely, so the representable functors, or the represented functors, A, G, blank, you know, this is in particular a covariant functor from A to abelian groups, is a finitely presented Compact uh, projective object, I'm sorry, in this abelian category. Uh, and when we let G vary through all compact lead groups, as G varies, these functors form a set of projective generators. So, since all compact Lie groups don't quite form a set, but a proper class, of course, this means we have to go over representatives of the isomorphism classes of compact Lie groups to get a set of projective generators. Similarly, we also have injective co-generators, and there's enough of them. So, the functors... Now I sort of do the representable functors in the other variable, but I need something covariant again, so I look at homomorphisms of the leading groups. Uh, of a functor um, A now blank in the first variable into K. This is contravariant, and I take homomorphisms pointwise of abelian groups into the injective co generator in the category of abelian groups, the divisible group Q mod Z. Uh, I've taken contravariant uh, functoriality twice, so this is a covariant functor, and this turns out to be an injective object. an injective object in the category of global functors. And again, as k varies, this form a set of injective co-generators. So projective generators means that every object admits an epimorphism from a direct sum of these particular projectives, and injective co-generator means that every object admits a monomorphism into a product of copies of these particular injective objects. So these properties are, as I said, completely general. They would work with any pre-additive indexing category. They have nothing to do with the global Burnside category. But in particular, it follows that the abelian category of global functors is a golden big abelian category with enough injectives and projectives. In particular, you have projective resolutions, injective resolutions, and you can do homological algebra pretty well in this category. So here is a reference where you can uh, look this up. I would like to mention one property that is specific to the global Burnside category, 
And this comes from an extra piece of structure that's around, but that I will not focus on very much in this class. Uh, as you probably know, and as I already mentioned before, orthogonal spectra have a smash product. Um, with, the, with the help of these smash products, you can define pairings on the equivariant homotopy group functors, external pairings, internal pairings, and that in turn can be processed to eventually lead to a symmetric monoidal structure on the global Burnside category, which on the level of objects is just given by the product of compact Lie groups. And on the generators, it's also fairly easy to understand. Basically, um, the symmetric monoidal product of two restriction homomorphisms is a restriction along the product of the group homomorphisms. And also, the, the, the symmetric monoidal product of two transfers is the transfer from the product group up to the product group. I don't want to discuss this in detail because I have to select what I talk about and the smash product and multiplicative aspects won't, be, won't play such a strong role. Since the indexing category we're taking functors out of, the global Burnside category has a symmetric monoidal structure and the target category of abelian groups has a symmetric monoidal structure under the tensor product of abelian groups. On this functor category, we also get a daytime convolution product. So this is what I call the box product of global functors. Again, I don't really want to talk about it uh, in detail, but this plays the role of the tensor product of abelian groups in non-equivalent stable homotopy theory. And it plays the role of the box product or convolution product of G-Mackey functors in the situation of G-equivalent stable homotopy theory. Good, now we know what global functors are and we know some properties of this category of all global functors. How about examples? So here is the topological example, but really probably the most ex important example of global functors for our purposes. And then for every orthogonal spectrum X. The equivariant homotopy groups in dimension zero, the zero equivalent homotopy groups assemble into a global functor. For which I use the notation pi zero underlined of x and then no group because the group is varying. And this is simply in a tautological way. So I don't have to really define anything on objects pi zero underlined of x. It has to be a functor, so I have to tell you what it sends the compact Lie group to. And here I just take pi zero g of x, the zero of g equivalent stable homotopy group. And the operations act in the topological way. So the functorality for morphisms act by evaluating at x. So if you have a natural transformation, from pi zero g to pi zero k, you simply look at the value at this particular orthogonal spectrum x, and that's what the functor assigns to uh, the natural transformation. Of course, this works in the same way for other integer gradings, but I will usually mostly concentrate on pi zero, and this is the key example for us. In this example, we can also let the x vary now, and because natural transformations are natural, uh, we get that the whole thing together this assembles into a functor pi zero underlined. So now I'm going to let the orthogonal spectrum vary too. And then it's a functor from the category of orthogonal spectra to the category of global functors. Some properties of these functors are immediate, so I'm going to write them down here. So for example, this functor factors over the global homotopy category. over the global stable homotopy category. Simply because that was defined as the localization at the class of global equivalences. And this functor, by design, takes global equivalences of all orthogonal spectra to isomorphisms of global functors. Another immediate property is that pi zero takes wedges to direct sums. So we, we know this, and I reminded you of this, that this is true for the G-equivariant homotopy group 
individually, and then it's just the additional fact that in this functor category, sums and also products are again given pointwise. And it also preserves finite products. By zero on and on preserves finite products. For the same reason that in the functor category, like in any such functor category, products are given object-wise or point-wise. Every orthogonal spectrum gives rise to a global functor in a rather tautological way. So an obvious question is whether, conversely, every global functor arises from an orthogonal spectrum. And if this is indeed the case. Every global functor is isomorphic to the global functor pi zero underlined of x for some orthogonal spectrum x. But the situation is even much better than that. So if we're a little bit more careful, we get a rather strong uniqueness result. For this, I have to introduce the appropriate notion of the maclean object in this context. So more precisely, for every global functor m, there is an eimberg maclean spectrum. Formal spectrum and I'll adapt the traditional notation and call this H M such that and now comes the usual property that I'm the McLean objects would have. If I take the case homotopy group global functor, so where I do this construction in dimension k as opposed to in dimension zero. Well, then this is isomorphic as a global functor through the given global functor for k equals zero, and it's zero for k not equals zero. So this zero is the zero object in the abelian category, which more concretely means the zero functor that takes every abelian group to a trivial abelian group. This is still not the best possible result, because you can do even better. Let me define a subcategory of the global stable homotopy category, math color H, with a full additive subcategory of the global stable homotopy category GH with objects all H, all X such that. They are in the McLean spectrum for some global functors, so in other words, such that pi k g of x equals zero for all k not equal to zero in all compact g groups, d groups g. So I look at this as the full subcategory of the global stable homotopy category, and then it is additive, it's closed under sums and products because equivalent homotopy groups take finite bridges to sums and finite products or products. So now on this category, I have the pi zero underlying functor, so the only k for which I could possibly get non-trivial things out, and then the functor pi zero underlined from this category to the category of global functors, and this is an equivalence of categories. So what is the difference between the previous statement and this statement? Well, this statement also has strong information about the morphisms. So every morphism between I and the McLean spectra is uniquely determined by what the corresponding morphism of, of global functors is. And in particular, this also means that two realizing objects are uh, isomorphic in a preferred way. If you have a global functor and you fix this isomorphism here, then the way how it's realized is unique up to unique isomorphism in the global homotopy category. I hope to return to the statement in more detail later, and this is a consequence of some structure on the global stable homotopy category, maybe what I call the standard T structure. So T structure in the sense of Bernstein, Bailitz, and N. Dean. The T structure comes from the fact that we already have these equivalent homotopy groups, so we can define a notion of globally connective orthogonal spectrum. 
That is one where all the equivariant homotopy groups vanish in all negative dimensions. And we can define a globally co-connective orthogonal spectrum. That is one where all equivariant homotopy groups vanish in all positive dimensions. And then, as I hope to explain later, one can show that these classes define a T-structure, a non-degenerate T-structure on the global stable homotopy category. If you know what a T-structure is, then this H is exactly what is called the heart of this T-structure. A general fact proved by Bernstein, Balins, and Andy Lean is that the heart is always an abelian category. And what I'm telling you here is a calculation of the heart of this abelian category in this special case, namely it's isomorphic to the uh, abelian category of global functors. For the time being, I will just give you a reference where you can look this up. However, this is still not the best possible result, so you can do even better than this. And to formulate this even stronger result, I would like to use the notion of infinity categories. So let H hat be the full subcategory of the global stable infinity category. So what do I mean by this? Well, there's at least two ways how you can interpret this. Uh, you can look at the one category of orthogonal spectra and the class of global equivalences, and you can look at the localization in the sense of infinity categories of orthogonal spectra at the class of global equivalences. That is an infinity category. It actually turns out this is a presentable stable infinity category. One convenient way of proving this is to first establish a global model structure that extends the global equivalences and to prove that this is a stable global model structure. And then it's a general fact that the infinity category associated to this is a presentable, and in this case, presentable stable infinity category. So now in this infinity category, I take the full subcategory, but now in the infinity categorical sense, and not in the one categorical sense, with the same object as above. Um, I didn't say this. With objects, the einberg McLean spectra as above. In the global sense, einberg McLean spectra. And then the functor, pi zero underlined, now from H tilde to global functors is an equivalence of infinity categories. So what is the difference between this statement and this statement? What is the extra content of this? Well, global functors are just one category, so I consider it as a discrete infinity category. There's no higher homotopy information in the mapping spaces. Whereas this a priori would be an infinity category with no restrictions on what the homotopy types of the morphism spaces could be. Saying that this is an equivalence of infinity category means that this is homotopically one category, so uh, all the morphism spaces are homotopically discrete. So the difference between this statement and this statement is that this also contains higher information about the mapping spaces. All the higher homotopy groups in the mapping spaces are zero, so it's an even stronger uniqueness statement than this statement is. Nevertheless, when it comes to proving this, the mathematical content in these two statements is almost the same. You just need the correct setup of T structures in the context of stable infinity categories. And then there's not really much more information in this statement than in this statement. But the way it's formulated, it is a stronger result. And this is what I think is the ultimate result about uniqueness of einberg mclean objects for global functors. I don't know, unfortunately, a reference where this is stated explicitly in this form. So I have to leave you with that. I could have introduced this concept of global functors at least two lectures earlier and tell you that these global functors form a grown decabelian category and that the equivalent homotopy groups of orthogonal spectra give examples. These were all fairly formal and tautological things. But if I'd done that, then we would have this abstract abelian category now, and we wouldn't really have any idea what we're talking about in reasonably explicit terms. The reason that I spent the last two lectures developing this explicit presentation of the global Burnside category in terms of restriction and transfer operations is that we can now relate this abstract notion of global functors 
to something more concrete, and in particular we can show how it's related to other notions of global Mackey functors that people have studied and that people have looked at. After all, this is clearly not the, the first time that somebody looks at global generalizations of Mackey functors. So let me first tell you what the explicit structure is that's contained in the data of a global functor. So the data of a global functor M is equivalent to the following data. So if I were even more precise, I could formulate another category and then the equivalent two would mean an equivalence of categories, but let me leave it like at this. So first of all, what's actually really the data you have to give? You have to give an abelian group M of G for every compact E group G. Well, that's what the functor does on objects. Then you have to give a restriction homomorphism. Either up or down from M of G to M of K for all continuous homomorphisms. And the next piece of data is to give us transform homomorphisms. Transfer L to K from N of L to N of K for all closed subgroups L of K. So, of course, the alpha upper star and the transfers will be exactly the same things with the same names. You evaluate the global functor on the operation alpha upper star or on the transfer. And as I showed, the abelian groups of morphisms in the global Burnside category are generated by composites of transfers and restrictions. So, clearly, a global functor will be determined by this data, by the values, the action of the restrictions, and of the transfers. But to get a well defined um, thing on the morphism sets in the first place, and then more importantly, to actually get a functor to make this compatible with composition, various relations will pop up if you go through what this really means to be compatible with composition. And these are exactly the relations that we've already seen earlier that hold for these operations on the equivalent homotopy groups of orthogonal spectra. So let me write down one more time the complete list of relations that this data has to satisfy so as to come from a global functor and then necessarily uniquely. So this data has to satisfy the following conditions. So first of all, the restrictions are contravariantly functorial. Restriction homomorphisms are contravariantly functorial in alpha. Then the transfer homomorphisms have to be covariantly functorial. The next thing you need is that inner automorphisms act as the identity, so restriction along an inner automorphism is the identity operation. Then you will need that the transfers along an inclusion with infinite vial group is zero. Transfer LK equals zero if the vial group of L and K is infinite or equivalently has positive dimension. And then two more things that you will need to show that this defines a functor that it's compatible with composition is how transfers interact with the various kinds of restriction maps and we, get, we have to impose the relations that we've seen before. So first of all, transfers commute with inflations in the sense I've pre previously formulated. And finally, the double coset formula holds. So 
when I will discuss examples of global functors, I will sometimes be able to give you the examples in closed forms, so sort of really write down the functor of the global Burnside category, and then if you, you will probably usually immediately see that it's a functor, and then we're all set. But in some other cases, I will give you this explicit data, and then I will often only check some of these conditions and leave some of them to you. I might indicate which ones are obvious and which ones are complicated. Global versions of Mackey functors have been around for quite some time and they have been extensively studied both in the algebraic and also to some extent in the topological community. So I should explain how the notion of global Mackey functor that I'm using is related to other notions that people have previously considered. The largest part of the literature that I know of is in the context of finite groups, so where we're not looking at all compact Lie groups, but only at finite groups. And in this context, various people in the algebraic community have studied representation theoretic and homological properties of versions of global functors. In those communities, this goes, these objects go under different names. Depending on exactly which variation you look at, they might be called global Mackey functors or they might be called inflation functors, if inflations are included in this. And a common term for many of these constructions is also biset functors. Here is a list of some references to the literature where these things are studied. I make absolutely no claim to completeness. In particular, in the algebraic context, there's a vast literature, and I don't have even an uh, approximate overview of what people have looked at. As a matter of fact, I only know a single paper where exactly the same kind of global functor that I am using is coming up, although under a different name, and that is this paper by Peter Simons, where these are called functors with a regular Mackey structure. And apart from that, I am not aware of a, of a reference where this is used for compact Lie groups in exactly the same way that I am doing. I want to spend a little bit more time on explaining the connection to the biset functors to allow you to make a connection to the algebraic literature. And so for this, we will now restrict our attention to the class of finite groups for some time. I want to introduce an algebraic category that I call the biset category, and it's often called something like this. So, the biset category, for which I write a different kind of A, has all finite groups as objects. So this is also going to be a pre-additive category. A log G K. So this is the Groton D group. Of G free K times G sets under this joint union. So the elements are formal differences of isomorphism classes of finite sets with a left k and a right g action, and we're imposing a freeness condition. The action on the right of the group G has to be free. The isomorphism classes of such G free k g by sets form an abelian monad under disjoint union, and you form the Groton Dieck construction and uh, the group completion, so you add formal inverses to this. This biset category is supposed to be a category, so how does composition work? So composition will be a biadditive map from A of K L cross A of G K to A of G L. And this is induced by a balanced product. So on the classes of actual bisets, it's given as follows. If you have a LK biset, L acting on the left, K acting on the right, and the right K action is free, it composes with a KG biset by 
taking S times K and co-equalizing the right K action here and the left K action here. There's a bunch of things to check with this definition, which I will just tell you what you'd have to check, but not how. You have to check that this is well-defined on representatives. That's really reasonably straightforward. The next thing to observe is that this um, balanced product construction is additive in both variables, and that will tell you that this extends to the Groton deconstruction to formal differences. And then the associativity of this balanced product construction will tell you that this is associative. The unit, by the way, is uh, G itself with the action by left and by right translation. So now I claim that this category is isomorphic to the full subcategory of the global Burnside category generated by finite groups. So let A thin be the full pre-additive subcategory of the global Burnside category on the finite groups. So only the zero dimensional complete E groups. Um, I'm going to give you a functor. from the thin global Burnside category to the Byside category as the identity on objects. After all, in both cases, the objects are all the finite groups. And then on morphisms, I have to give you an abelian group homomorphism from A of GK to A of GK, we take the additive extension of the following. So here we have pinned down the basis a little bit earlier. These were natural transformations of the form transfer from A to K after alpha upper star. Now some things like uh, the value condition go away, we're only in the context of finite groups, the double coset formula is much easier, so restricting to finite groups makes a bunch of things simpler here. We're going to send this to the isomorphism class of the KG biset that I denote by K over L alpha G. And what is this? K over L alpha G is just a quotient of this set, K times G, modulo the equivalence relation where you identify an KL G with K alpha of L G, where the letters are supposed to be interpreted in the obvious way. Little k is from capital K, little l is from capital L, and little g is from capital G. Again, there are a bunch of things to check. I just tell you what you'd have to check. Um, first of all, this is well-defined. If we change um, a pair L alpha by a K times G conjugate, then you have to get an isomorphic KG set. Of course, here the K action is from the left, the G action is from the right. Maybe the first thing you want to check is that the G action is actually free on this. Um, and then, then another thing to check is that this is an isomorphism of abelian groups. This goes roughly as follows. KG sets, of course, decompose canonically into orbits. And then you get a basis of the, this abelian group. It's also going to be free, and you get a basis consisting on the transitive G-free KG bisets. And then a little algebraic observation is that every transitive KG biset is exactly isomorphic to one of these forms for some L alpha. And moreover, if you form this for L alpha and L prime alpha prime, you get isomorphic KG bisets, if and only if the pair L alpha and L prime alpha prime are conjugate in the sense that we earlier had by an element from k times g. So that tells you that this is actually an isomorphism of a given groups. For individual g and k, and then you have to check that this is actually a functor. And what's involved in there is the fact that on both sides, composition is uh, ruled by the double coset formula. So you basically have to st establish a double coset formula in this context of G times K sets. So altogether, we get an equivalence of categories
from the thin global burn set category to the spy set category. And that, of course, means we get an induced equivalence on the categories of additive functors. So the category of thin global functors, or the version of global functors where you only have finite groups as your objects, global functors restricted to finite groups are equivalent to additive functors on this spy set category. And this is usually how you would see it in the algebraic literature. Most of the time, people would introduce, introduce a spy set category such as this, or with small variations, and then you get additive functors on that category. The biset category admits some variations that I would like to discuss. The most obvious variation is that you don't index by all finite groups, but only by some specific subclass. But this is not the interesting kind of variation because that we can also do in global homotopy theory. We can also restrict the class of finite groups, so that's not really a difference. More importantly, you can play around with the stable-like conditions. So for example, we, can, we could also insist on the freeness of the left k action. So in previous definition, I looked at the left k and the commuting right g action, and I insisted that the right g action is free. We could also require the left k action to be free. And the effect would be to take away the inflations. To remove the inflations. So to see this, you should go through the explicit equivalence that I've given you. And you should check that restriction along a subjective homomorphism with a non-trivial kernel will not give you an action where the k-action is free. We could also go in the other direction and we could drop the freeness of the right g-action. We could drop the requirement of the freeness of the right g-action. So this would give us more morphisms in the corresponding biset category, so we would get additional operations, and this has the effect of introducing what's typically called deflations. This has the effect of introducing deflations. That's the name that's often used in the algebraic literature for this. So deflations are in some sense the dual or the covariant analog of inflations. So deflations are transfers along subjective homomorphisms with a possibly non-trivial kernel. Uh, or we could play around, we could use intermediate stabilizer conditions. So after all, you know, being free means that the stabilizers are only allowed to be to the trivial subgroup. And if you don't impose a condition, you can have all sorts of stabilizers, and you could play around with imposing some intermediate stabilizer conditions. If you make sure that this works well under the balanced product, you get a category again. And for all these variations, you can now look at additive functors out of such a modified biset category. And this is something that actually has been done extensively in the algebraic literature. However, our decision to work with a formal spectrum equivariant homotopy groups pins down a particular kind of global functor. So it singles out a particular kind of global functor. So if I write this as a slogan, we have in restriction inflation and transfers, but we don't have deflation. So somehow, you know, we didn't say in the beginning we would like to have maybe deflations and transfers but no inflations. We said we want to work with orthogonal spectra. 
Then we had the, ortho the equivalent homotopy groups, and then the global burn site category was simply defined for us as natural transformations. And then it was something we didn't put in, but we calculated that the operations exactly correspond to arbitrary restriction homomorphisms, meaning restriction to subgroups and inflations. But for the transfer direction, we can only transfer along injective homomorphisms. So this is something to be aware of and to be careful about if you go into the algebraic bisect literature and you find some interesting result and you want to apply it to global homotopy theory. You better first check that the kind of bisect functor that's used in that particular paper is one that you can use in global homotopy theory. If you want to prove a result about orthogonal spectra, then the result about the bisect should be the same bisect category that corresponds to the fin global burn set category. Otherwise, the result simply might not apply here. It's time for examples. The class of examples that has already come up is given by the represented global functors. So the global functor represented by a compact Z group is simply, well, the represented functor. We take morphisms from G into something that varies, and this is a covariant functor from additive from the global Burnside category to abelian groups. I'd already mentioned them when I discussed the abstract properties of the abelian category of global functors because these functors are projective. It's, that's a direct consequence of the representability property of the enriched unit dilemma. And in fact, an arbitrary projective object will be a direct sum and of a direct sum, possibly infinite, of these projective generators. These particular global functors arise as the homotopy group global functor of some important orthogonal spectrum. We know that the evaluation homomorphism at the stable tautological class, so this goes from A, G, K to pi zero K equivalent sigma infinity plus. E global G is an eiffel isomorphism for every for all G and K. That means if we fix G but let K vary, then we get an isomorphism of global functors. So it is an isomorphism of global functors. from this represented global functor A, G, flank to pi zero underlined of the global classifying space of G and then it's unreduced suspension spectrum. So this is uh, not anything new, it's just a reinterpretation of this isomorphism that I've proved two lectures ago. So I've already told you that every Global functor arises as pi zero of some orthogonal spectrum. For this particular global functor, it's a very prominent and explicit orthogonal spectrum. Of course, this is not an Einberg McLean spectrum, so this has vanishing negative dimensional equivalent homotopy groups, but this will have a lot of non trivial stuff in positive dimensions in the equivalent homotopy groups. So it realizes a pi zero, but this is not one of the examples of an Einberg McLean spectrum of a global functor. I want to specialize to the most trivial case of a compact Lie group, the trivial group. So for G equals E, a trivial group, the constant orthogonal space, constant one point orthogonal space, is a global classifying space. Also something I'd mentioned earlier, after all, the trivial group is the only one where the zero-dimensional vector space admits a faithful action, and if you take that model, you get the constant one-point orthogonal space. And that means if we do the suspension spectrum, sigma infinity plus, of a global classifying space of the trivial group, and if we use this particular model, then this is the global classifying space of the point with a disjoint base point added, also known as S0, and this is isomorphic to the sphere spectrum. Global sphere spectrum. So the special case of this result for the trivial group is that we can identify the piezo equivariant 
underlined, the global functor, given by all the equivariant stable stems together in dimension zero. This is isomorphic to taking morphisms out of the trivial group in the global Mernsat category. And of course, the isomorphism is also something very specific. It's given by evaluation at the stable tautological class. And in this model, that's just the one, the multiplicative unit. Uh, evaluation of an operation at the class one in pi zero non-equivariant of the sphere spectrum, the class represented by the identity of S0 or the identity of your favorite sphere. So for finite groups, if k is finite, then pi zero underlined of the sphere at k is just the zeroth k equivariant stable stem is isomorphic to morphisms in the Burnside category from A to K. And if you either work out what this was from the explicit description or by using the equivalence to the biset category, then this is isomorphic to the Grobendi group of finite K sets. Grobendi group of isoclasses of finite K sets. So this result is originally due to Graham Siegel. And then in general, so if K is an arbitrary compact Lie group, then pi zero K equivalent of the sphere spectrum is just a free abelian group. And it's given by transfers from L to K of one. So this is the one in the L equivariant, zero stable stem. And this is for controversy classes of subgroups L and K with finite value group. So let me give you one example of the smallest interesting non-finite compact Lie group just to make this a little bit more explicit. So for example, what happens if we do pi zero of u1 equivalent of the sphere spectrum? Well, we have to identify the closed subgroups of u1. Well, that's easy. So there are the finite cyclic groups given by the groups of roots of unity of a particular order. And there's the full group u1 itself. This group is abelian, so every subgroup is normal. And in particular, the finite subgroups of U1 always have infinite index in their normalizer, which is all of U1. So that means all the finite subgroups of U1 will not contribute to zero-dimensional homotopy classes. And the only thing that contributes is the group itself. So we get out that this U1 equivalent zero-dimensional stem is just a free abelian group of rank one, and it's generated by the multiplicative unit. So this looks a little bit as if these finite subgroups of U1 don't contribute anything to this. But as a small aside, uh, which is not really very important right here, but I can connect this to something I've mentioned a little bit earlier. So a long time ago, I talked about the dimension shifting transfer. In particular, we can do the dimension shifting transfer from the trivial group all the way up to U1. And this is one of the situations where the dimension shifting transfer really shifts the dimension, where there's no shift in the tangent representation. So if I apply this to the element one, the same element one that is up here, I go up the dimension by one. So this lives in pi one, u one equivalent of the sphere spectrum. And this is an element of infinite order. Element of infinite order. And similarly, you could start with a multiplicative unit in the equivalent homotopy group from some finite subgroup of U1 and then do a dimension shifting transfer up to U1 and this will give you other elements of infinite order. So the finite subgroups, don't, they do contribute, but not to pi zero, they contribute to pi one equivariant in here. The last example for today is the constant global functor. constant global functor of an abelian group N is the global functor that I write and underlined with values. Well, it's supposed to be constant, so the value of the compact E group G is always this abelian group A that's given with 
alpha upper star or the restriction homomorphism along an arbitrary continuous homomorphism is the identity of n. And despite the fact that it's called constant, you cannot set the transfers to be constant. I mean, that would violate the double coset formula. But the transfer L to K is multiplication by the Euler characteristic of the homogeneous space. Multiplication by the integer Euler characteristic of K. Model. This is an example of a global functor that I've not presented to you in closed form. It's particularly not immediately obvious that this is a functor, that it satisfies all the relations. So I invite you to go through the list of relations that you have to check. If you do that, you will see that most of them are either completely obvious or not terribly difficult, except possibly for two of the relations that I would like to briefly comment on. So the first relation that might not be completely obvious is the fact that infinite index uh, transfers from a subgroup with infinite vial group should be zero. And that means that we should better convince ourselves that the Euler characteristic of this homogeneous space k mod l is zero whenever uh, the w k l, the vial group of l and k, is infinite. Or in other words, if this has positive dimension, if it's not like a finite discrete group. So I would like to give you the classical argument for this, how you can, one way of how you can see this. So a group WKL acts freely and smoothly on K mod L from the right in just the following way. So K mod L times WKL to k mod l, so we send the coset little k l, comma kappa l, so kappa has to be an element in the normalizer, and we just send this to k kappa l, so this is well defined, it's an action, it's smooth, n, and this is going to be relevant in a second, it's a free action. So if the dimension of the vial group is positive, greater equal to 1, then it contains a closed subgroup that's a circle group. There is a closed subgroup H of WKL isomorphic to the circle group U1. And we can restrict this free action of the vial group to this subgroup, so we get a free action, so K mod L as a smooth and free action of this group H, which is isomorphic to U1. So whenever we have a smooth action on a smooth manifold and that action is free, then we can form the orbit space and we get a smooth fiber bundle. So the projection from K mod L, modulo K mod L, and then divide it out this H action from the right is a smooth fiber bundle. With all the spaces involved compact and with fiber H. And for such smooth fiber bundles with compact base, total space, and fiber, the Euler characteristic is multiplicative. So that means the Euler characteristic of K the modulo L is the product of the Euler characteristic of the fiber, which is H, times the Euler characteristic of the base, which is K mod L modulo H. And luckily, we don't have to know what this is at all, because this is the Euler characteristic of H. H is a circle. This is 0, and hence the product is 0. So that's the end of the proof. The other non-obvious, at least to me, condition that you have to check to verify that this Functor, this constant global functor is indeed a global functor, it's a double coset formula. And this has come up before. The double coset formula that we would have to verify for an unaligned amounts to the what I call the checksum formula. From lecture four. So what that was this formula? So now we have inside of G, we have two closed subgroups, K and H, and then this formula holds. 
the Euler characteristic of G mod H is equal to the sum over M of the internal Euler characteristic of M times the Euler characteristic of K modulo K with a G translate of H. Here the sum and the way how G is related to M and the internal Euler characteristic are all as we discussed in the double coset formula. And uh, this is what we have to check in this particular example. This, the verification of this formula is not completely trivial, at least not to me. I think it's reasonably complicated and I don't want to uh, tell you anything about how to prove it here, but I'd rather leave you with a reference. Today I would like to end with an exercise. When I discuss the relationship between unstable equivalent homotopy sets and stable equivalent homotopy groups during the last lecture, I made some vague comment that the passage from an orthogonal space to its unreduced suspension spectrum freely builds in the extra structure, by which I meant the abelian group structure and the transfer structure. You now have the chance to make this vague statement precise. So here's the exercise. Show that for every orthogonal space, y, the global functor pi zero underlined of the unreduced suspension spectrum of y is freely generated. by the rep functor pi zero underlined of y. This is not quite a precise statement yet, so I have to explain a little bit more what do I mean by freely generated. Well, a free functor is always a left adjoint to some forgetful functor, and in this situation you can forget from global functors to rep functors in the following way. underlying rep functor of a global functor M is simply the following composite. I start with the category rep op. I go to the global Burnside category, which happens to be a pre-additive category, but I'm ignoring this right now. This functor sends G to G, it's the identity of an object, and it sends alpha to alpha upper star to the associated restriction homomorphism, so I have an op here which fixes that. I have a global functor, so that's an additive functor from here to the category of the building groups. And then I forget to the category of sets. And so the composite is exactly a rep functor, contravariant functor from rep up to sets. This is the underlying rep functor of a global functor. And I'm exactly forgetting the transfers because here I'm only picking out the restriction homomorphisms, but not the transfers. And I'm forgetting the abelian group structure. So left adjoint to this would mean that you're freely building in this structure that I've forgotten in this process, the addition and the transfer maps. Now it's something, a general fact, that this forgetful functor from global functors to rep functors has a left adjoint, but that's not the exercise I would like you to solve. I would like you to prove a precise statement that amounts to the identification of what the left adjoint does on pi zero underlined of y. And here's the precise formulation of the exercise. So we consider a morphism of rep functors from pi zero underlined to y to pi zero underlined of sigma infinity plus of y, or really on the target I'm looking at the underlying rep functor in the sense just defined. I call this morphism little sigma because it's just made from all the stabilization maps that we call sigma upper g as the compact Lie group varices. So for an orthogonal space y, I have this morphism of rep functors where on the target I've forgotten from a global functor to its underlying rep functor. Now the thing to show is that if you have any other global functor m and a morphism of rep functors, little phi, from pi zero underlined y to m, and the target is again to be interpreted as the underlying rep functor, then there is a unique morphism of global functors from pi zero underlined 
of the sigma infinity plus y to m, such that the original morphism of red functors factors as this morphism of global functors after the stabilization maps. So if you sort of spell this around, this exactly identifies the value of the left adjoint on pi zero underlined y, and it tells you that it's this global functor. That's all for today. Enjoy the exercise, and thank you for your attention.